Good evening, boys and girls. I am going to continue reading from By the Great Horn Spoon. So for this session, I'm going to read chapter seven because I know not all of you were in class the day that we did. So here we go. Chapter seven, end of the race. When the Lady Wilma entered the Blue Bay of Kaleo, Jack counted 31 sailing ships at anchor. He was disappointed that nowhere to be seen was the high riding sea raven. She's loaded up with coal and fresh water, snapped Captain Swain, loaded up and skedaddled. Nevertheless, smiles were the order of the day. After months at sea, the gold seekers looked upon the sunny little town as if it were Paris or London. They couldn't wait to get ashore. Hardly had the mooring lines been thrown out like bull whips when men began to leap to the wharf. Master Jack, shall we go ashore, said Praiseworthy. I'd like that fine, smiled Jack. Jack posted another letter home to Boston. The streets thronged with sailors and gold seekers, and in the distance, the great Andes rose like painted scenery. The town wasn't a great deal larger than the ship they had just left at the fueling wharf, but it was land, dry land. Jack had almost forgotten the smell of dust in his nostrils. He breathed it in like perfume. The butler and the boy rode about on mules, and the day had all the excitement of a picnic. Late in the afternoon, Mr. Azaria Jones hailed them in the sunny plaza. Look here, he beamed, I bought the last pick and shovel left in town. Since the California fever started, the shelves are bare, I can tell you, and a wash pan thrown in for good measure. They're yours. Voila, said Monsieur Gant, appearing out of the crowd and dropping a pick and shovel at their feet. I have got my hands on the last ones in town and a wash pan too, my friends. Then he stopped to glare at the Yankee trader, who was already glaring at him. Gentlemen, smiled Praiseworthy, I think we can safely say that you have found the last two picks and shovels left in Kaleo. They're bound to bring us luck. Master Jack and I, his words of gratitude were interrupted by the clanging of the Lady Wilma's bell calling the gold seekers back to their ship. Hurry, boys, shouted Mountain Jim. The wild bull of the seas would be mighty glad to leave without us. There was a wild rush for the wharf, but when Jack turned, Praiseworthy was no longer standing beside him. Jack's hair very nearly stood on end. The butler was gone. Praiseworthy, the ship's bell rang through the air, but Jack didn't know which way to run. He couldn't leave Praiseworthy behind. Hadn't he heard the ship's warning bell? What had happened to him? Praiseworthy! Jack was unable to move, as if anchored to the spot by the pick and shovel. He had to fight back a welling up of tears. The Lady Wilma would leave without them. And then, from the doorway of a nearby shop, the butler appeared, tall and elegant in his bowler hat and white gloves. He carried the new pick and shovel over one shoulder, the wash pan under an arm, and a strange package wrapped in newspaper and string dangling freely from his hand. Jack had never been so happy to see anyone in his life. Hurry, he cried desperately. We'll get left behind. Not likely, said Praiseworthy. I had to stop off and make a small purchase for our good captain himself. Come along, Master Jack. Jack tried not to let Praiseworthy see that he'd been close to tears. He threw the pick and shovel across one shoulder, gathered up the wash pan, and together the boy and the butler hurried toward the wharf. One by one, alley cats picked up their trail. By the time they reached the ship, it looked as if every stray cat in Kaleo was after them. Before the gangway could be raised, at least a dozen assorted cats followed Praiseworthy aboard. In their stocking caps, the crew was too busy throwing up hawsers and preparing for sea to bother with the invasion of Peruvian cats. Jack dropped the heavy pick and shovel with a clang to deck and looked at Praiseworthy's package. A dead rat? he asked. Hardly, replied the butler. Cheese? Not likely. Fresh kidney? Exactly, said Praiseworthy, raising the package out of reach of the cat. Captain Swain is extraordinarily fond of kidney pie. I promised to teach the cook an old recipe my great-great-grandfather used to prepare for the Duke of Chisley. 
But at that moment, Captain Swain was in no temper for kidney pie. The ship had taken on fresh water, but not an ounce of coal. And if you guys remember, when they ran out of coal, they had to rely on the wind and had a really hard time catching up to the sea raven. Blast the sea raven, he was bellowing. She's filled her bunkers and piled her decks with coal. Hills of it, mountains of it, taking every lump to be had in Kaleo. She's made sure there wasn't a cinder left for us. Once at sea, the Lady Wilma picked up a friendly breeze. If her coal bunkers were empty, she was at least lighter in the water and went skimming along her course. The Peruvian cats learned to bound out of sight every time the husky-throated boat swing came along, threatening to toss them overboard. In an unguarded moment, a snap of the wind carried off Praiseworthy's bowler hat. It went tumbling into the sea, filled with water, and sank. Praiseworthy was left speechless and hatless. For three or four days, he was not quite himself. He missed the hat. He hardly felt like a butler without it. But Jack thought he looked just fine. A week later, as the heat bore down on deck, Praiseworthy began tying a handkerchief around his head. Jack liked that even better. You look like a pirate, he smiled. Nonsense, Master Jack, said Praiseworthy. Hoping for a supply of coal, Captain Swain dropped anchor in, Gal in the Galapagos, but there was nothing to be had except a few cords of stove wood on those barren islands, and there was even less to see except the sharks in the bay. The Lady Wilma pushed on. With the rush for gold, steamers were only just being sent around the Horn to the Pacific, and fueling stops were rare. Weeks later, off the coast of Mexico, a sudden excitement raced along the decks of the gold ship. The sea raven had been sighted. She was lumbering through the sea, low in the water, weighted down by her extra tons of coal. They stood in enormous black piles on her weather decks. Billy be hanged, shouted Mountain Jim. We're gonna pass her up. Jack stood on the rat lines and his heart raced with delight. The sea raven looked half sunk in the sea. Her passengers could be seen at the rails, glum and silent as the Lady Wilma pulled ahead. By grabs, Captain Swain beamed, doing a little jig on the paddle box. I guess if there's anything heavier than a ton of bricks, it's a ton of coal. By the time the brown hills of California appeared off the port side, the Lady Wilma was well in the lead. Meanwhile, the Peruvian cats had Peruvian kittens. I'll drown them, everyone, swore the boatswain, but he had to catch them first. They ran for cover whenever he approached, disappearing within seconds. They found every hiding place aboard ship and invented new ones. Jack tried hard to ignore them, for good luck had taught him a lesson, but in the end, he was putting out galley scraps at night. Every morsel would be gone by morning. Dr. Buckby spent his days fishing with the line tied around his peg leg. He would drowse in the sun until a tug roused him. But when his back was turned, the fish would disappear as if into thin air. The wily cats grew fatter. As San Francisco and the end of their long voyage drew nearer, the gold seekers began to trim their beards again they packed and repacked their sea chests, they scrubbed their clothes, and they hummed, whistled, and sang the same tune. For I'm going to California with my washbowl on my knee. Jack's thoughts raced ahead to the gold fields. What would it be like? Would there be grizzly bears and outlaws and wild Indians? Certainly, he told himself. It was an untamed place, wasn't it? What was the use of an untamed place if there weren't wild Indians and outlaws and grizzly bears? We ought to have a gun, he told Praiseworthy. A gun? Why? To protect ourselves. Stuff and nonsense, said the butler. Jack noticed the other gold seekers busily cleaning sidearms and rifles and sharpening their knives. He wished he had a gun. A four-shooter, maybe? Or even an old army musket with a bayonet. One bright morning, with San Francisco not more than a day's run, the bountiful winds died away. By afternoon, clouds had gathered in the sky, and headwinds bore down on the gold ship, as if to drive her back in her wake. With steam in her boilers, the sea raven came steadily on course. 
By dusk, she had caught up to the Lady Wilma, passing with a wild shout of glee and a victorious blast of her whistle. Boys, said Mountain Jim, it looks like we're done for. Not a bit, said Praiseworthy, on his way to the pilot house. The Lady Wilma was already making a wide tack in the wind. She might be blown hundreds of miles off course even as far away as the Sandwich Islands. The voyage isn't finished, sir, not by a long shot. But even to Jack, with the wind snapping his shirt, it seemed that the Lady Wilma's luck had run out. Captain Swain would lose command of the new clipper ship building on the ways in Boston. Jack dug his hands in his pockets and glanced up to the pilot house. The wild bull of the seas didn't have a lump of coal to fight the headwinds. Jack was asleep in his hammock when he was aroused by a strange sound. At first, he thought it must be Mr. Azaria Jones snoring in his sleep, or Mountain Jim, or Dr. Buckby, but they came awake too. A deep throb ran through the ship, and then another, and a splash of the side wheels could be heard, then another, and another. The gold seekers bounded out of their bunks, some of them in nightcaps, and collected on deck. Sparks were flying from the funnel. Steam had been built up in the boilers. What's the captain burning? said Mountain Jim, scratching his red whiskers. Cats? Hardly, said Praiseworthy above the crash of the side wheels. He gave Jack a wink. Neither cats, nor bricks, nor spoiled potatoes. As any stowaway could tell you, gentlemen, we're carrying lumber in our cargo holds. Thousands of feet of it. Lumber enough to build a hotel. It occurred to Captain Swain to purchase what he needs with the ship's fuel account. Makes a fine shower of sparks, doesn't it? But the race was not yet won, and Jack could sleep no more that night. He pulled on an old pea jacket the frog voice boat Swain had handed down to him and stood with Praiseworthy at the rail. This would be their last night aboard ship, after all. The paddle wheels twirled faster and faster, and the bow spirit came around on course like a compass needle. Needle, excuse me. It was you, wasn't it? Jack grinned. Me, Master Jack? You told the captain about the lumber. Oh, he knew it was there, but with all his storming about at the bricks in the hold, he hadn't stopped to give the lumber a thought. I merely reminded him, you might say. In the dark of morning, the Lady Wilma had managed to gain on the sea raven. The gold ships thrashed bowsprit to bowsprit, and the red glow of their smokestacks lit up the surrounding sea. More lumber, shouted Captain Swain into his voice tube. I want every ounce of steam the boiler will hold, and then some. The sea raven, too, was making a final sprint. By noon, the golden gates stood ahead of them, but the extra burden of her mountains of deck coal was too much for the sea raven. Beat by beat of her side wheels, the Lady Wilma pulled slowly ahead, Wood sparks showered from her funnel. She entered the sparkling narrows of the Golden Gate and finally came out into San Francisco Bay. The city stretched out across the sand dunes like something that had sprung up the night before. There seemed to be more ships in the harbor than houses on the shore. Let's go to anchor, Captain Swain shouted from the pilot house window. A moment later, the anchor chain went rattling into the bay and hats went flying in the air, beaver hats and straw hats and even a cat or two. Okay, I'm gonna read that sentence one more time and I want you to picture this in your heads. A moment later, the anchor chain went rattling into the bay and hats went flying in the air, beaver hats and straw hats, and even a cat or two. Could you imagine cats flying through the air? I don't know. Praiseworthy and Jack gathered up their picks and shovels, wash pans and carpet bags, and peered at the golden hills of San Francisco. The houses looked like packing boxes with roofs, and tents of every description were pitched along the dunes. Gentlemen, said Praiseworthy, tugging on his white gloves, I believe we've won the race. After a 15,000 mile voyage and five months at sea, the gold seekers had arrived. Well, I sure can't wait to find out what happens to Jack and Praiseworthy once they leave the ship. We will find out when we read Chapter 8.